All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's presentation, ILM 310304F, Vibration Analyzers in the Analyzer section here. 60-ish uh, slides in here uh, on vibration. Not too much theoretical stuff in here. A uh, little bit, some theoretical math, some practical math that we're going to have to do. Nothing really mind-boggling. Uh, we look at uh, basically the, the relationship between the different variables that we measure when we're talking about vibration, and then we look at uh, three different types of vibration probes and uh, get to know the ins and outs and ups and downs and advantages and disadvantages and uh, why and where we used uh, vibration measuring. So it's, uh, as I was saying in their pre-chat, uh, not something that instrument technicians do very much of anymore. Uh, generally, um, millwrights tend to take the vibration section of a plant and, and run with it uh, from the instrument and control side. Uh, most of the time, or lots of the time, uh, our work is generally limited to, limited to uh, removing them from uh, service so that mechanics can do some work, then putting them back in the service and setting them up. Um, after that, the monitoring and analysis part is generally done by no rates, but uh, good for us to know as much as we can about uh, all this stuff, of course, because that's why we're figs, because we're awesome. All right, so today's objectives, five of them. Describe vibration as it relates to force and motion. Describe the units of measurement relating to vibration monitoring, and there's lots of those. Uh, describe the components of the vibration monitoring equipment, not too bad there and describe where vibration monitoring is commonly used, so all good information. So objective one, uh, describe vibration as it relates to force and motion. So most of us are familiar with vibration when we say what is vibration. Uh, quite simply put, vibration is uh, an object that's moving back and forth, side to side, or oscillating, or any kind of motion that it's not really designed to do. Uh, we call as a vibration. So it could be a vibrating pump, a vibrating motor, vibrating belts, vibrating fans, uh, any type of mechanical motion, whether it's uh, spinning, shaking, wobbling, oscillating, whatever it might be, uh, could be seen as a form of vibration. Machine vibration is just back and forth movement of a machine's component. So uh, if it's moving, it's oscillating back and forth, it's vibrating, uh, and how fast or and how bad it is is what we're going to learn about today. Most machine vibration is unintended, of course, and undesirable, so we want to try to avoid it at all costs. It usually leads to uh, irreparable damage. So we use vibration, uh, monitoring for vibration, uh, for a couple of different things. First of all, monitoring machine vibration and using that information can save us money. Uh, we can, through various methods, detect uh, the progressive wear of a machine um, through vibration monitoring. Lots of times we get clues, audible clues, uh, that equipment is starting to fail. Um, most of us become relatively familiar with the workplaces that we're in, and we can go from building to building, and we can actually listen and we can hear changes in the way that machines are operating. Uh, that's usually the first clue that something is uh, starting to go on us. Um, but to measure what is going on, we of course use uh, vibration monitoring. So we can use uh, vibration monitoring for preventative maintenance and predictive maintenance to let us know if something uh, could possibly be on its way out. So we can do a couple of different things here in terms of vibration. Uh, the first one is, is called, and we break it out into what we call vibration monitoring, which is a continuous, uh, continuous measurement uh, and usually uses an online type analyzer. So it's always recording a value of what's going on. And then the second method is called vibration analysis. And vibration analysis is typically a periodic activity um, often this will be done with handheld uh, analyzers 
uh, where we go and we check an individual piece of equipment. Um, there's varying degrees of importance in terms of vibration. Some things like exhaust fans aren't going to have online analyzers uh, built in for them, whereas uh, things like gas compressors, of course, uh, would have built-in things. So there's different applications depending on the potential severity that we might experience should we run into unexpected vibrations. So our purpose is to start understanding what's going on with vibration and there are some certain keys to understanding vibration dynamics. Um, a vibration basically is consisting of four related motion characteristics and they are displacement, velocity, acceleration, and frequency. And when we're measuring uh, for vibration, we're getting relative motion be between a part and our detector. And as the relative motion increases and decreases the space between the part and our detector, we can then electrically usually uh, create a sine wave that represents what is going on in terms of how much is it moving in terms of the peak to peak displacement and we can also determine how fast it's moving and how fast it's changing by using peak acceleration and peak velocity we can also use our peak to peak times in order to give us a frequency to help us uh, diagnose certain things that are going on in in vibration so when we measure vibration we're really we're measuring the relationship between acceleration, velocity, displacement, and time all together. And um, they kind of call these, there's, they call these vector quantities. Some of them are vector quantities um, because they measure uh, certain changing measurements. So um, when we measure vibration and we talk about vibration, we're talking about the interrelationship of all these different characteristics. So the first one we'll break them out into individual characteristics is displacement. Uh, by definition, it is the shortest distance from the initial and final positions of an item. Um, it is measured in mils, and a mil is equal to a thousandth of an inch or 0 0.0254 millimeters. So when we measure displacement, we're measuring the total amount that the object moves. This would be moving uh, away from the object and then moving towards the object and moving away from the object and moving towards the object. So that is measured in distance. Velocity is the measurement of the rate and direction of change in position or, or the rate or change of the displacement of an object. It's measured in inch per, inches per second or mils per second or microns per second and you're going to see a lot of different units uh, available. Um, most of them are relatively closely related. So one mil in this case is 25.4 microns. Maximum or peak velocity is always used for measurements. And actually we always use the largest measurement possible uh, regardless of whether it's uh, displacement, velocity, uh, or acceleration, whatever it might be, we always try to use the maximum measurement that we can get. So when we're looking at a uh, graph of velocity here, we, we, we can see a lot of different things on this graph. And by the end of the description of these individual characteristics, we'll kind of plot them all on this graph here. Um, but this tells us that as, as we're moving here, we're coming up, we're, we're kind of accelerating, then we're starting to slow down right here. At the point at the top, we have minimum amount of velocity. We're kind of at zero here. Then we start accelerating as we go down the hill, we go down the hill, and just before we get to the bottom of the hill, we're at the maximum velocity. And then we start slowing down again as we start getting to the bottom where we, again, are at the minimum velocity. And then we start accelerating again until we reach maximum velocity as we cross this center line here. Acceleration uh, is the rate of change of velocity over time. So it's a play or it interacts with the velocity uh, measurement that we had earlier. In one dimension, acceleration is the rate at which something speeds up or slows down. So here we have, uh, looking at that same graph, if I was starting here, if this was my maximum velocity, and I moved up and I had minimum velocity up here, I'm basically sitting at zero, standing at the red light, and then I hit on the gas. 
And so I'm going to have a maximum acceleration right here. I'm accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. And then from this point on, I'm kind of just coasting. Well, I'm not really coasting, but I'm not accelerating as fast as I could be anymore. I reach my uh, minimum amount of acceleration, but my maximum velocity. And then I start slowing down again. And then again, maximum acceleration as I start going up again. Acceleration is measured in inches per second squared or mils per second squared, or Gs. So lots of different units out there. Just to re refresh our memories, 9.81 uh, for the G, same uh, gravity number we've always been using. Uh, if you want to confuse yourself, there's the standard version of it, but we don't have to really worry about that. Um, frequency, last uh, measuring criteria related to vibration is the rate at which a machine component oscillates. It's called its oscillation or vibration frequency. The higher the vibration frequency, the faster the oscillation. Pretty straightforward stuff. Commonly used frequency units are cycles per second, or the one we're most common with is hertz, and cycles per minute. Hertz is the unit equivalent to cycles per second, uh, and frequency is uh, one of the uh, major uh, measurements that we use to find the cause and we'll see this later on uh, when we get into some of the more advanced graphs we change from this type of a graph to a different type of graph and you'll see how frequency can be used to find the cause and as I was mentioning in our pre-discussion here um, there are a lot of different causes uh, and vibration analysis in itself is uh, is a trade or a skill a uh, standalone skill basically that you could spend your whole life doing on your own. Um, there is a lot involved to it, but understanding the analysis of uh, the measurements can give us uh, actual components to inspect. So there's different causes of vibration, um, misalignment, looseness, bearing defects, worn gears, uh, something called oil whirl, uh, different component issues such as bent or cracked blades, veins, uh, housings, bad mounting, uh, defects in the motor, general unbalances of the shaft, all kinds of different vibration causing uh, situations. Uh, and we can actually, using frequency, we can um, narrow down our suspect area um, in terms of analysis. So uh, you'll see later in the presentation here how we can use frequency to kind of point us in the right direction as to what kind of uh, symptoms we're dealing with. So here we have some common types of machine unbalances. This is kind of taken out of the ILM. Um, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Taken out of the ILM, but I thought I would just kind of leave this in there because I thought it was relatively important. Um, we're going to talk just real quickly about static unbalance and dynamic unbalance and, and define them really quickly here. Uh, static unbalance is a single mass unbalance parallel to the center line of the rotating forces. So if we look at the diagram here on the right, you see I have a weight on the side of our shaft. And this is a little hard to describe uh, on a computer. Um, but if that weight is on the side of our shaft, and if you, let's say you held a uh, a pencil up in front of you and you stuck that weight on your pencil and you spun uh, you spun that pencil around. If you could do it fast enough to make a difference, you would find that the, that weight or that static unbalance would make the shaft uh, stay parallel to your eyeballs, but it would move away with the weight as the weight moved away and then it would move closer as the weight moved closer and the whole shaft would move back and forth equally at the same time. In, in parallel to its uh, axis of rotation. Dynamic unbalance is a little bit different uh, where the center line of the rotating forces is shifted on an angle due to more than one mass unbalance causing the force in more directions. So um, for example, um, if I had, I guess this isn't a great example necessarily, uh, the unbalance is off to the side or whatever uh, and that pencil then kind of wobbles in a couple of couple of different dimensions. So just some different things to um, thought I would point out. Okay, so here's a little bit of a uh, 
elaboration on that frequency and, and diagnosing for potential problems. So different components can contribute to different vibrations. And we see in this image here, uh, we have a situation where we could have unbalanced fan blades or a loose belt or the airflow going over the fins of the fan, the actual airflow or, or bad bearings, um, all potentially uh, causing vibration issues. And in this situation here, you can see that an, an un unbalance has a certain frequency. Uh, a looseness has a certain frequency, which looks like it's twice the unbalance. Um, a blade passing by will have a different frequency based on the number of blades there are. So if there was four blades, uh, there would be, let's say, this many peaks. If there was eight blades, there would be twice as many peaks, um, et cetera. And the last one here, you can see we have uh, what characteristic, look, characteristic uh, frequency uh, image of what a bad bearing would look like. So if we were to combine all these, and you can see this in this uh, fancy graph here, all of this information is wrapped up inside this one graph here. So in order to be able to interpret that, it does take a lot of time and a lot of experience. Um, and that's why typically vibration analysis is done by a specialist. So here's some common types of uh, machine uh, vibrations. Again, this isn't in the ILM, um, but I didn't really see any images in there that show this nice and clean and clear cut. Um, most vibration measurements on rotating equipment are going to have an axial measurement measuring the, the thrust back and forth of the shaft going this direction on the horizontal axis. And they'll also have a probe on the radial side measuring for any um, elliptical, or and I guess elliptical is the word I'm looking for, um, changes. Uh, if there is looseness in the journal bearings, for example, the shaft could move side to side or up and down. And we usually measure um, both of these um, areas at the same time. So looking on a larger machine, for example, I have a rotor here, I have a main bearing, I've got a gearbox, I've got a generator, uh, we've got some connectors in between all of these different things. And you'll see that we have a multitude of different sensors throughout, uh, throughout the machine in order to tell us how the individual components are are operating and it's important to you know to have several of them because everywhere we have a coupling um, there's potentials for misalignment and other things and misalignment is uh, one of the major uh, vibration contributors so this is why it's uh, alignment is such a critical practice for uh, the mill rates so you see there's a lot of things going on in vibration measurement there's displacement there's velocity there's acceleration uh, and there's frequency and we have to uh, take these all into consideration uh, when we're doing analysis. So moving into objective two, describing the units of measurements related to vibration monitoring. So we've dabbled in these already uh, in the previous slides, but let's just go over them again here. Displacement, the physical displacement of the machine, machine for us here in Canada, usually measured, uh, uh, still measured in mills, mill rates don't, tend to change. They like their thousandths of an inch. Uh, we can also do it in millimeters, of course, and there's probably an exercise in your future where you're going to have to uh, do this conversion, but if you've got a calculator, it should not be too difficult. Uh, velocity, again, rate of change uh, is measured in inches per second, and acceleration is inches per second squared. So those are the typical units that we're going to use. Thous, or thousandths of an inch, inches per second for velocity and inches per second squared for acceleration. And then last but not least is our good old friend gravity at 9.81. Okie dokie here. So acceleration, displacement, and velocity are all related to frequency, as we have said earlier. We use terms like peak to peak and RMS to describe the amplitude of a sine wave. And those of you who are electricians uh, are very familiar with this. I don't know if we did this in first year uh, instruments or not. I believe you did. So some of these terms should be familiar. Um, we always use the maximum values from the wave. Whenever we get a wave, we always use the maximum values. So again, we've got our frequency measured from uh, this peak to the next peak, wherever it happens to be. Uh, and then we've got this value here, which is our peak value in displacement. And then we got a value from here down to here, which is our peak to peak value. And if we want to convert back and forth, there's a bunch of 
different conversion factors that you may or may not remember from back in the good old days. But to get from peak to RMS, you multiply by 0.707, and to get uh, peak from RMS, you multiply by 1.414. So mm, not too much uh, complicated stuff here. Displacement, again, measured in microns or mils. Microns are metric and equal to millimeter, millimeters times a thousand, and mils are in inches times a thousand or a thousand of an inch. And here's all your fancy conversions there if you ever need to, if you ever need to do those. And guess what? Here's an example of some math. So this is about as deep as the math uh, that you're going to have to do. I would make sure that these are in your um, formula book. They should be. Uh, if not, you might want to put them in here. So pretty relative, uh, relatively simple math here asking what is 15 microns and millimeters? Uh, if we have 15 microns, uh, there's a thousand of them in a millimeter, then our answer is going to be 0 0.015. So there's no mind blowing uh, math here. Okay, peak to peak, dis peak, to peak displacement is 0.2 mils. What is it in inches? 0.2 mils out of a thousand mils in an inch is 0 0.0002 inches. So nothing crazy there. Velocity units. Again, velocity is the rate of change of displacement. The units are millimeters per second or inches per second. Acceleration, again, is the rate of change of the velocity. And keeping in mind that as we're going up the hills and down the hills of the sine wave, that velocity is constantly changing. This means that acceleration also changes. Again, the units could be Gs, uh, millimeters uh, per second or inches per second. So here's a little, uh, the little exercise on page 10 in the ILM, just doing our uh, conversion here. Uh, convert acceleration of 0.2 Gs, uh, two inches per second and millimeters per second. So here's the formulas from the ILM and from your formula sheet that tells us uh, to get Gs, we take inches uh, inches per second squared and divide by 386. That will be the same as millimeters per second divided by 9,800. So we can take that number and plunk it into both of these formulas. And uh, through a little bit of crisscross extrapolation here, we can get the math. So, so far the math is um, pretty doable. Okay, frequency. Uh, frequency uses two units, uh, cycles per minute and cycles per second, uh, or hertz. And right? you can be technical and call that three units if you want. Uh, one cycle per second is the same as a hertz, uh, which is also equal to 60 cycles per minute, right? One hertz times 60 is one cycle uh, per minute. So nothing crazy there as far as math goes. So, so far, this is all pretty painless, I hope. All right, so uh, example again, page 10, shaft rotating, rotating at 10,000 RPMs, vibrating at a frequency of 1,000 cycles per minute. What is it in seconds? Well, 160 cycles in a second times 60, or divided by 60, sorry, in this case, is gonna be 16.7 uh, hertz. Then all you're gonna do is make sure you get your math right, take a minute, divide by 60, Take a minute, multiply by 60, whatever it is you need to do. If the vibration has a time period of 0.002 seconds, what is its frequency? So it does one of these every 0.002 seconds. How many does it do in one second? One over 0.002 is 500 cycles in one second. So again, math pretty straightforward, thankfully. Okie dokie. So here's the graph I was telling you about earlier where it kind of shows where everything kind of is on the same on the same graph. All of those units can be found on the sine wave representation for vibration. And again, they are all related to one another. So here, peak acceleration uh, occurs just as we step on the gas. Peak velocity occurs just as we cross the center line. And peak to peak displacement is from top of this peak to the top of that peak. Here's some wonderful math that I am going to say not to cause yourself too much stress over. Um, if you see this in the ILM self-test questions, 
uh, there is an expect, expectation to do it. If you do not see it in the self-test questions, relatively safe to say that I'm probably not going to ask you uh, to do this in any uh, quizzes or exams. Uh, that being said, most of these formulas that we're going to look at here um, are in the formula sheet and you could apply values from the questions uh, to the formulas and, and uh, end up getting the answers. At any rate, the important part on this slide here is that we understand that Peak displacement is at 90 degrees and peak velocity is at 180 degrees and peak acceleration is at 90 degrees. So if we looked at um, all of these things, uh, these things here, so 0, 90, 180, 270, 360, or 0. So uh, it might be handy for you to put uh, those over here. So peak displacement appears at the top here, so 90 degrees. Peak velocity would be 0, 90, 180, so peak velocity and peak acceleration will occur at 90 or technically just after 90 as it leaves off the, off the line there. Okay, here's some nasty math examples off page 12. Uh, I'm not going to get into them uh, step by step here. The formulas are the formulas and all you need to do is uh, plunk in the values from the question into the appropriate formula. Uh, again, I don't believe that these show up in the ILM. Let me just check really quickly here. Uh, I don't think so. So again, uh, math not too bad. I'm not going to work through. The, I'm not going to work through these ones. Objective three: getting to something a little less painful here. The components. Vibration system consists of these three components. First and foremost, the vibration transducer or pickup or sensor, uh, which converts the motion or relative motion into electricity. We will also have a connecting cable, and then we'll have the readout, which we commonly uh, refer to as the analyzer itself. So now we're going to get into the transducers. And we look at three of three transducers, basically. Okay, the first one is called a displacement or proximity or eddy current type probe. Uh, these measure the actual distance change and measure in mils. We look at velocity probes, which again are mils per second. And we look at accelerometer probes, which measure g-force or uh, mils per second squared. They all have specific frequencies where they work best. There is no one that can do it all, but one of them does come pretty darn close, as you'll see at the end. Uh, and if you've worked with vibration uh, at all in the workplace, uh, you might know already that one of these probes is far more common uh, than the other ones. But we will look at them individually to see where they are best suited. Uh, and then we'll end up at something at the end of the tunnel here. Okay, so displacement probes, also known as eddy current probes or proximity probes, are non-contact probes. Highlight that in your ILM. It's the only probe that's non-contact. They work on the principle of measuring the gap distance between the probe and the machine part, and they will produce a magnetic electromagnetic field. They have a little uh, wire. Uh, coil type set up there and they excite it with a, a high frequency oscillator and as the metal part uh, comes into the range and out of the range it changes um, the oscillation characteristics of the of the probe and from that we can get uh, we can get measurements so the uh, fancy way that they say in the ILM here is as the measured material gets closer to the magnetic field, eddy currents are formed and it loads down the radio frequency, changing its amplitude. We will use displacement probes when vibration is not well transmitted through the machine case. So here's the kind of generic image of a displacement probe, and it doesn't do a whole bunch of justice, but basically the oscillator here uh, sends out a high frequency signal that goes uh, through here that kind of creates its own magnetic kind of field and as the gap between uh, our metal object or our machine and our probe changes 
it changes the magnetic field within here, which changes the, the ability of the oscillator to, to keep on making that same oscillation. And it changes, and that, that change is measured by the detector. Um, you'll see here uh, non-contacting pickup, which is kind of not very intuitive because it is threaded directly into the machine. But we see that there is there's a gap here, and we're measuring that gap here. So we're not actually measuring any touching. We're measuring the gap, which is why we call this non-contacting. Okay, displacement probes, in order for them to work, the shaft must be conductive but it's not necessarily magnetic, okay? Um, the type of metal will affect the signal output. So if you're working on a vibration system, say it's on a compressor, uh, and they do some work on the compressor and they gotta change out the crankshaft. Uh, I was talking to a student this morning, said they're changing out the crankshaft. Well, if the, if the metal of that crankshaft is not the same metal as the old crankshaft, it's gonna change the measurement value they'll be relative, uh, still the same, but the amplitude of them will, will change. So they are, uh, they are hinged on that metal type. So you wanna make sure that you're aware uh, of that effect. Okay, so here's kind of, uh, here's kind of the way uh, the displacement probe works and what kind of a signal it gives out here. So looking at example A here, we have a stationary shaft with fixed, fixed gap distances. So uh, nothing is moving here. At its furthest point, we'll get an amplitude that looks like this. At its neutral point, we'll get slightly less amplitude. And at its closest point, we'll have even less amplitude. In image B, here we have a rotating shaft and the gap changing with that vibration. So essentially, we're turning this shaft now. And at some points, uh, it's farther away and it's closer. Okay, so this relationship between the size of the sine wave and how big or small a gap is might be something you want to remember. So we have larger amplitudes um, with larger gaps and smaller amplitudes with smaller gaps. And usually the, the measurement is, is there's so many micro, millivolts per, per micron or, or something like that. Calibration of displacement probes. This is an awesome one. Uh, it's difficult to make the machine that it's installed on to have a severe, a severe vibration, so we have to simulate the vibration. And the device that we use to calibrate uh, displacement probes is called, and here's an image of it, uh, it's called a wobulator. Uh, yes, that is absolutely true. The name of this machine is a wobulator, and it is more or less uh, a record player that plays a warped record. Uh, and it simulates the movement of the machine and creates relative amplitudes and frequencies. The next slide is just a real quick rundown of the process uh, of running through a calibration here. Uh, I'm not gonna elaborate on this too much. I've, I've never seen a wobulator in real life although I'm sure they must exist. Um, ultimately, what we're doing here, it's similar to flow measurement where we're creating a scale factor. And all that scale factor is, is basically uh, an arrangement or a chart that gives us the relative change in the output voltage due to the change in distance that we measure in mils. And it looks a lot like this here. So scale factor basically just says, for every mil, I'm gonna change X number of millivolts. So in this example here, uh, we're starting at one volt and we're going to 13 volts. And our distance is 20 mils to uh, 80 mils or 82 mils here. Here are the actual numbers. So 13 to one volt, so 12 volt spread there, actually millivolt spread whatever it is, doesn't matter. Uh, and the measurement 82 to 20, so that's what we're showing here, uh, is telling us that every mil is gonna result in a change of about 193.5 millivolts. So we're creating a scale factor, uh, not unlike a meter factor that we did for flow. Um, different shaft materials, again, 
making sure you understand that different shaft materials play an effect and will have a different scale factor. That's why they have to be conductive. Okay, pros and cons. Uh, advantages of displacement probes, uh, they are used typically where machinery is constantly monitored uh, and they have the lowest frequency response of the three types. Disadvantages, uh, they are very sensitive to surface scratches, uh, magnetic spots or shaft variations. So we have to be aware of these things. Next up are velocity probes. J output is proportional to the speed of movement. We're talking about velocity. They are a contacting probe, which means they are mounted on the equipment being measured. Um, these particular probes are constructed with a movable coil. Here's a spring you see, some magnets, a strain gauge essentially here, and a movable coil and stationary magnets. As the coil moves through the magnetic field, a voltage is created, its own voltage is created, and the voltage produced is proportional to vibration. So as this thing goes back and forth, it makes its own little voltage. Advantages, it can, through calculations, be used to give displacement and acceleration readings. That's your first clue as to where we're developing here in terms of these probes. Uh, and like many other lectures, we started out with the simplest, oldest technology, and we're going to build up to the most complicated and probably the most common modern technology. Disadvantages of velocity probes is they're larger. Uh, they are affected by temperature and magnetic fields. They are more expensive, and they are not very accurate at low frequencies. Next up is the accelerometer. Here you see an accelerometer. It's got some piezoelectric discs in here. Uh, it's got a mass. It's got an amplifier. And remember about piezoelectric things when they're uh, exposed to force, you apply force to a piezoelectric crystal, it generates electricity. So we have a mass in there. Uh, when that mass, due to the g forces of, of gravity uh, or acceleration, that mass puts pressure on the discs, the discs create electricity. Okay, an accelerometer is the most common sensor, highlight that in your ILM. They often use an amplifier to increase the measurement signal, again because the measurement signals are generally very small, millivolts, we want to make them bigger. The accelerometer is a transducer with an electrical output directly proportional to the acceleration characteristics of the vibration, often constructed of a piezoelectric crystal or quartz as the sensing element. So again, piezoelectric material generates current or a voltage when it is squeezed or force is applied to it. The output is proportional to the squeeze, the force is proportional to the acceleration, and the output is proportional to the acceleration. We can get a scale factor again, same way we did before, the number of volts over the vibration units. So an example would be if the scale factor is 100 millivolts per G and the trans, uh, transducer is putting out 50 millivolts, what is the amplitude in Gs? Well, it's going to be the ratio of 15 over 100 times 9.81, so 15 over whatever times 9.81 uh, should be 0.15 Gs. So no fancy math there. I don't think that appears anywhere else either. Little blurb here on triaxial uh, accelerometer probes. This is just one little smidgen of the ILM. As the name implies, they would measure triaxially uh, in three axes, X, Y, and Z. Therefore, they'll have an output for each axis. Advantages and disadvantages. These are small, lightweight, and rugged. They have wide frequency and temperature ranges and are not affected by magnetic fields. They are especially sensitive to high frequencies. And here's the kicker, they can also be converted, or their measurements can be converted to give velocity and displacement. So an accelerometer based on this statement can do it all. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Disadvantages? Um, because of this especially sensitive 
nature of them, they must be firmly mounted, very firmly mounted. So how do we know what transducer to pick? Well, you could be an expert and that would be easy, or you could just work on the stuff that your plant has there already and that would be easy. But if you are asked, there is a way to do it. Uh, each type of transducer has a frequency range in which it is most accurate. As you can see from this little table here, uh, displacement 0 to 1500 hertz, velocity 8 to 1500 hertz, and acceleration 1 to 20,000 hertz. So looking at this chart, something kind of sticks out to me. Why would I go with this or this when I could just go to this? And here's why. Accelerometers have a wide frequency range and thus are often used to measure all three parameters. The analyzer can then convert our acceleration into velocity and displacement. So long story short, displacement's good, velocity is also good, but really we can buy one probe, an accelerometer, and we can get all those measurements from one, providing the transmitter can do it for us. All right, moving into less painful areas here, readout devices and the analyzers themselves. So the whole deal with vibration is that we must sense it, uh, then generate a signal we can use to get it to a display so that we can see it. So aside from built-in monitors, the online analyzers that we're talking about, uh, there are also portable methods of measuring vibration. Uh, there are things called vibration pencils, which are pocket-sized devices used to check for increased vibrations on walk-arounds. And this is something that maybe operations would do. Uh, and, you know, you go around every Monday and you touch it to motor A and motor B, and uh, maybe you record it in a, on a chart or something like that, and you can kind of do that periodic checking. Uh, portable accelerometers can also measure and record data for all three parameters. Um, I've used these before and many mill rates will use these. Uh, vibration pencils are probably obsolete now. Uh, the portable accelerometer again can measure everything. So why not just use one of these? And then of course, monitors, which is what we're really talking about when we're talking about vibration analyzers, these continuous monitors that are online, always taking measurements. Uh, those are the, the Mac Daddy ones, right? Okay, monitors again, permanently installed meters that continuously monitor vibration. Obviously this has advantages. It can warn us of changing conditions. It can warn of impending breakdowns. It increases machine utilization, uh, meaning, you know, we know that uh, this one is wearing out more than the other one. So let's run the other one uh, until they both get close to the point where we got to do some work on them. So you can get your maximum mileage out of your machine before you do maintenance. Uh, helps to identify faulty components. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Uh, and we can improve production quality by monitoring things all the time. Objective four, monitoring. Now we're about three quarters of the way through here now. So describe where vibration monitoring is commonly used. Well, it's commonly used on expensive pieces of equipment that we don't want exploding. Anywhere there is rotating equipment, you will find vibration devices. Uh, they will vary in complexity from handheld devices or vibration switches to expensive monitoring equipment like uh, you know, the, oh, I can't even think anymore, the 5000 series of Bentley Nevada stuff, for example, that continuously monitors it all the time. So again, we look at monitoring from two different angles, um, vibration monitoring, uh, which can be periodic with a handheld test device or continuous using a, an analyzer. And when we're using the analyzer, quote unquote, we can get immediate actions on fault conditions like alarms, shutdowns, and indications. So that's important uh, for high dollar pieces of equipment. And then the second, uh, second vibration analysis where we record and analyze data to interpret it at our convenience. Uh, and then we can decide when maintenance should occur. So not nearly as critical, um, but useful. Uh, so that we can be proactive. Different monitoring types, and I believe this is not part of the ILM anymore, but some of this stuff 
uh, you can pick up on your own. So like visual analysis, for example, uh, checking for obvious broken parts or cracks or a common one back in the day. And if you're OG, OG guy like me here, the screwdriver or stethoscope method, if you're an automotives guy, um, you may have done this. You can use your ear to identify problems. If you took a long screwdriver and you put the handle on your ear and you kind of touch the other end to different parts of a motor, it amplifies uh, localized sounds and makes it easier to, uh, to uh, determine where your problems are. Okay, again, continuous monitoring used for shutdown protection, uh, permanently mounted to equipment used to shut it down in case of problems, and also, again, strongly and often used for predictive maintenance in order to extend machine life, reduce downtime, uh, reduce energy costs, et cetera, et cetera. So all kinds of different uses uh, and applications for monitoring. Okay, here we get into some science. Uh, talking about natural frequency on page 30. Natural frequency is the frequency that an object vibrates at due to its construction. Um, if a machine is allowed to vibrate at its natural frequency, severe levels of vibration may occur. Natural frequencies are also called resonant frequencies, and we're going to talk about some uh, funky science here in the next, uh, next little couple slides anyway. Okay, so resonance, what is resonance? If a machine is pushed, quote unquote, by a repeating force with a rhythm matching the natural oscillation rate of the machine. So basically this is, um, you're driving down the highway. Most of us who used to be poor, uh, had a piece of junk car that if you got to a certain speed on the highway, let's say 85 kilometers an hour, uh, the car started to shake, uh, started to shake a little bit. If we let it continue to shake uh, at that frequency, um, it's going to get worse and worse. It'll, it'll vibrate more and more strongly um, due to the repeating first, uh, repeating force encouraging that machine to vibrate uh, at a rate that's most natural. That the machine will vibrate vigorously and excessively, not only because it's doing so because it wants to, but because it's receiving an external aid to do that. We don't like that. That resonance magnifies vibrations and makes things worse. So back to the car example, if we know that at 85 kilometers an hour, uh, we get that vibration at 90, it's a little bit worse because we're adding resonance. But if we push through to 110 or something like that, it goes away. Well, that's good. We want to get out of that uh, critical zone and that resonance zone so that we don't have the machine blow itself apart in, in essence. So resonance should always be avoided as it causes rapid and severe damage at critical speeds. And that speed where we start getting the speed wobble is the beginning of our critical speed. And the idea is to get into that critical speed and out of that critical speed as fast as possible to uh, have the least amount of damage possible. Okay, critical speed. Uh, we talk a little bit about critical speed here and there's some formulas uh, involving critical speed. You'll see one of them here is in uh, this yellow color, which means that uh, you do see this in the self-test at the end of the ILM. So this is something that you should uh, be able to understand here um, how to calculate the critical speed. Again, uh, the math, not terrible math. It's a simple three-part, three-variable formula where you just got to extrapolate uh, the formula from the study, uh, the study book into uh, into your question. Harmonics. So harmonics uh, are is a frequency that is a submultiple or multiple of the original vibrating force. So if we looked at, for example, this frequency here, 2400 hertz, a harmonic is a multiple of the base frequency. So the harmonics related to this 2400 hertz vibration would be 4800 hertz which is two times that frequency 7200 hertz which is three times that frequency or 9600 hertz which is four times that frequency so uh, if a vibration occurs at a certain frequency the vibration harmonics will be the integer multiples of that vibration frequency so we'll talk a little bit more about harmonics here again so 
this graph, as you see here, is not the same as the sine wave graphs that we've been looking at. This is called a frequency domain graph. Uh, and this is kind of the next level or the state of the art as to where we are in vibration analysis. This graph will tell us the amplitude, how big the peak is, and the frequency of the vibration. So um, it really is a bunch of graphs laid on top of another. Uh, we view this data with, with something called a frequency analyzer, uh, also known as a spectrum analyzer, or we sometimes call this a fast Fourier transform uh, picture. Um, these analyzers make interpreting the data much easier by matching the frequency to the source. Remember I said that different frequencies can indicate different problems with a machine, and uh, any one machine can have one problem, two problems, or 10 problems. Um, by spending a lot of time studying and analyzing vibration, you can determine based on the amplitude and the frequency at which you're getting one of these peaks, what the damage is in a machine. So there's a lot of things going on in here. Um, but long story short, uh, harmonics are just simply multiply, multiples of the uh, natural frequency of the vibration. So there's some little bit complicated theory in, in this little section in these pages here from 30 to 32 or so, um, but it's not terrible, terrible bad, I hope. Uh, okay, moving into something a little better here, transducer locations, page 33 here. So displacement again is non-contact. It measures the distance between it and the shaft surface. When we look at mounting it here or location, it is going to be mounted uh, next to the shaft. Here we're looking down the end of the shaft and we're measuring this small gap between the shafts. So as this shaft, if it were to move sideways like this, we would be measuring this gap. So that's usually where you're going to have it. It wouldn't matter if it was up here either, uh, but again, it has to be where it's measuring that gap. Uh, velocity and acceleration, on the other hand, are contacting and actually measure the vibration of the machine. And uh, distance, velocity, and acceleration, they're all what we call vector measurements. You electro electricians will remember doing vector math. Uh, it had to do with voltage and amps and angles and all that wonderful stuff, but they're all related uh, to, to each other and give us phase angles and all kinds of things. Uh, it's not really that different than vibration um, vibration measurement here, but because they're all intertwined uh, and they have these vector properties here, they're, we can get direction based out of them here. <clears throat> okay, some more transducer locations here. So again, on our machine here, we'll have axial sensors that measure uh, the measurement of the shaft going this direction, and we will have radial sensors which will measure it the opposite direction. Different mounting positions, again, there are different locations for radial measurements and for axial or thrust motion. So here's something for thrust or axial, and here's something for radial. And another important thing to remember here is something called the key phaser. Key phaser is a timing sensor that signals, scans, and acts as a reference. And the reason that it's called a key phaser is most often the point that we're measuring is the keyway on the shaft. Because uh, we have to have some kind of a zero reference on the sine wave in order to be able to tell where 0, 90, 180, 270, 360, where all those, uh, where all those locations are. And in order to do that, that relies on the key phaser. That is the reference point for all of our measurements. Orbital plots. Back when I was in school in the late 80s, early 90s, this was the extent of vibration monitoring. We had uh, an X and Y transducer mounted on a shaft here, and we simulated uh, the top diagram by putting a, um, a weight on the side of the shaft. And by having a weight on the side of the shaft, it would create an elliptical uh, representation of the shaft going around in circles. If the shaft uh, was moving properly and circularly and didn't have any wear anywhere and the bearing was beautiful, it would spin in a perfect circle and it would represent in a perfect circle. And we actually hooked these up to um, oscilloscopes 
and the oscilloscopes actually showed us uh, these shapes. And they could be, you know, off at a different little bit of an angle here, but regardless, that was what an orbital plot, uh, and that was the old, old school uh, representation of vibration analysis. Severity charts. So severity in vibration is uh, defined relatively simply, uh, as you see here, uh, rough, very rough, slightly rough, very good, smooth, very smooth, extremely smooth. Using a, a severity graph like this here, um, we can determine what qualification we would apply to a particular type of vibration. So the combination of the frequency and the amplitude will contribute to the severity of the vibration. Here we have the displacement, here we have the frequency. So if I was saying uh, something is vibrating at 12, uh, 1200 cycles per minute with uh, 0.2 mils peak to peak, I could come down from 1200 here, and that's, I believe this is the example from the ILM, uh, come down from 1200, draw a line down to our point two mils of displacement, and we would see we fall in this range here between uh, very smooth and very good, so we would call that smooth. So that's how you use one of these wonderful severity charts. So amplitude relates to the amount of stress and flexing. Uh, acceleration co contributes to the force that causes damage. So again, uh, as they go up, of course, we get into more critical situations. Vibration analyzer is finally getting something here that doesn't hurt at all. Uh, most analyzers are similar and will have the following features. <clears throat> Excuse me. They'll have an amplitude meter, uh, a frequency analyzer, amplitude, amplitude control, and units control, all mounted in a fancy housing uh, with a display, with keypads, configuration, diagnostics, all of that wonderful stuff. I don't know who the big players are in, in uh, vibration nowadays, but this Bentley in Nevada 3500 used to be the uh, used to be the Rolls Royce back in the day. Um, I'm not sure if this is in the ILM. To be honest, let me just quickly open my ILM here. Yeah, it is. So this is the culmination of everything up till now. Um, Many frequencies can be present in one machine. We told you that earlier. You've had a, you have an electric motor that's driving a fan, uh, and it's belt driven. You could have problems with the motor. You could have more problems with the motor, the mounting, the case, the alignment, the fan blades, the belt, all of those different things. Um, so, um, in other words, the main waveform always has other waveforms of different frequencies superimposed on it. And vibration analysis will break these waveforms down into frequency domain charts. And if you were a real vibration expert, this is basically what the state of the world is right now. If we were to take uh, a measurement of this based on the theory that we've looked, looked at, we'd get a sine wave that looks something like this. To us, it would be completely overwhelming. We have no idea really what this means. But what this is really showing us is something like this. It's showing us this sine wave. It's showing us a sine wave associated with perhaps a bearing defect. It's showing another sine wave here that's associated with gear mesh. So remember a gear will have 20, 30, 40 teeth on it. That frequency will be related to the number of teeth. And all of these get squished together. All of these waves that we see here get squished together and that makes up this, okay? So there's an evolution here. We get all the different components into one of these, and then that moves over into this, what we call fast Fourier transform. And this tells us the amplitude and the frequency, frequency on this line, amplitude on this line, of every single one of these defects or activities that are occurring in a machine. So it'll tell us that at 1200 hertz, I've got an amplitude of this due to imbalance. That's this line. Then it'll say I've got several different bearing defects, uh, one at this frequency, one at this frequency, one at this frequency. 
all of these amplitudes that represents this line, this line, and this line. And then here I have gear mesh issues uh, at this frequency, this frequency, and this frequency, and this amplitude all on here. So nowadays, this is what we look at when, when we do vibration analysis. We have a fancy machine with an accelerometer on it. We attach it to the machine, we take a recording, and it'll spit out something like this. And that's how we do vibration analysis. And that is the end of this lecture on vibration analysis. And it is also the end of the analyzer section of this course. So congratulations.